everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at today's uh, session entitled The Dialysis Care Team, Meet the Key Players in Your Healthcare. My name is Fiona Lawless. I'm the Senior Director of Corporate Engagement at the American Kidney Fund, and I'm excited to be with you today. In this session, we will be getting to know different members of your dialysis care team and their roles to support you in reaching your healthcare goals. You and your family are also important members of the dialysis care team. Your care team should consist of trained experts that will thoughtfully listen to your suggestions and concerns, as well as help you to take an active role in your own care. And while the members of your care team do work together, each person is able to answer different questions that you may have. So it's important to understand which player of your care team is best suited to answer your questions. We have a great panel for today's session, and I'd like to begin by introducing each of them. Dr. Maria Camila Bermudez is a nephrologist and is passionate about home dialysis modalities. She's an associate professor of medicine at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine and the associate program director of the Nephrology Fellowship at Geisinger Medical Center. Dr. Bermudez's area of work focuses on advancing care of patients requiring dialysis by promoting home therapies, education, and as well as empowering patients and healthcare professionals. Antonio Kane is a registered and board certified dietitian. He received his undergraduate graduate education in dietetics from Life University in 2003 and obtained a master's degree in business administration from the University of Phoenix Atlanta campus. His work experience includes geriatrics, public health and pediatrics, private practice, home infusion, public speaking, and food and clinical nutrition management. Antonio is an emerging dietetic professional with a special interest in health information and literacy. Ruth Simon earned a bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and went on to earn a master of social work degree from Norfolk State University. She is certified as a licensed clinical social worker and currently serves as a social worker for two Fresenius kidney care dialysis clinics in her hometown of South Boston, Virginia. Prior to working in dialysis, she provided services in a public mental health setting for 20 years in this same rural location. Providing services in a rural location presents many challenges, and Ms. Simon is an advocate for health equity measures to address these barriers. Gabrielle Turner G is the care partner and wife of Quentin G, an AKF ambassador. She is a proud mo mother to a five-year-old and works full-time while serving as a care partner. We hope this session will provide you with a lot more insight and we'll answer all of your questions or as many as we can during the last 15 minutes of the session. Uh, you're more than welcome to begin typing your questions now into the chat box to your right on the Kidney Action website. And we'll try to get to as many as possible. And for those that we can't get to, we will follow up afterwards. Now, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Bermudez to begin her presentation about her role as a nephrologist on the dialysis care team. Dr. Bermudez. Thank you, Fiona, for uh, such a kind introduction and welcome everyone to our session. Uh, next slide, uh, please. So let's start with what nephrologists do and, and where does the word nephrologist come from? So nephrologist uh, means a kidney doctor. It comes from the Greek words nephros, that means kidney, and logos, which is the study of. Nephrologists uh, treat a variety of kidney diseases, also uh, problems with blood pressure, high and low. We also take care of patients that have electrolyte problems, such as potassium, sodium, calcium. Patients with kidney stones, we help them uh, prevent developing kidney stones, and we take care of many other disorders. Next, uh, next slide, please. So nephrology practice, uh, we uh, vary from different clinical settings. So your nephrologist is likely going to spend a great deal of time in the office where you actually go to see uh, your doctor. Uh, we also go to the hospital setting to round on patients that either have acute problems with their kidneys or patients that are on dialysis that require to be hospitalized, uh, then we go and take care of them and support their dialysis during their hospitalization. And of course, we go to the dialysis unit to see our patients during treatment. Next slide, please. Ideally, you should be referred to see a nephrologist 
uh, when there is evidence in your blood work that your kidneys are not functioning properly. Uh, we stage kidney disease in five stages. Um, the one stage is very early, usually by, by stage two is when we see changes in your creatinine or something called GFR or abnormalities in your urine. And we recommend that then patients are referred to us so we can start trying to identify the problem and try to help uh, improve uh, the situation. Next slide, please. So the role of the nephrologist is going to be help with the diagnosis of the problem. And we're going to institute a treatment primarily focused on trying to slow the progression of your kidney disease, ideally to try to avoid the need for advanced therapy such as dialysis or the need for a kidney transplantation. When that becomes the case, um, then your nephrologist is going to uh, help treating you according to your personal plan and goals and values, then your nephrologist is going to refer you to see transplant for transplant evaluation. We are going to be educating you and preparing you for the treatment, dialysis treatment of your choice. And we're also gonna take care of you once you are undergoing dialysis. We will also take care of you as nephrologists after your kidney transplantation. And in some occasions, if the patient desires to undergo what's called conservative care, uh, which means no dialysis or no transplant, then your nephrologist will also take care of you. Next slide. So here we can see how the nephrologist is uh, going to be the coordinator of your care. As you can see here, you are, as the patient, you're in the center. You are the glue that is keeping your team together. Your nephrologist is going to be working in close collaboration with your social worker, with your dietitian, with your nurses, also with your care partners and family members, as well as your primary care provider or any other specialist that you see closely, such as cardiology, which is very common. Depending on the type of dialysis that you undergo, whether it is in center dialysis, and, and that is the one you're going to be going to your treatment three times a week, your, your nephrologist will see you in dialysis usually between one to four times a month. You do no longer have to go to the office. And if you are undergoing home dialysis, your nephrologist will see you once a month. And they will see you in either setting in collaboration with the whole team that I just described. I very much encourage all of you as patients to speak up and communicate with your nephrologist. Make sure you have an open communication and you have no hesitancy to involve your family as part of those conversations. Sometimes in the dialysis unit, it's hard to have deep conversation. So don't feel afraid to ask your nephrologist for a separate visit, sometimes to just discuss other uh, situations that may require more time and won't be addressed during dialysis treatment. So I think with that, I finished the overview of the role of your nephrologist. Thank you so much, Dr. Bidmudis. That was very thorough. I appreciate it. Um, just a few follow-up questions. What would you do? What, how would you recommend, uh, or what would you recommend for individuals on dialysis uh, as some advice to get the most out of their uh, treatments? I think communication is very important, and you know, keeping that communication open, asking questions, uh, as I mentioned, involving your family members. Sometimes it's just hard when you are the person undergoing the treatments. At times, not feeling well, not knowing what to ask. I think. Uh, communication is the most important thing. Ask about how you're doing. Try to understand your blood work, what they mean, how they are progressing month after month. Uh, what are your options? If your dialysis uh, can be optimized, you know, continue to have an open mind. There are different types of dialysis that may be beneficial at different times in your dialysis journey. So I think, you know, create that close relationship with your team, with your nephrologist. Don't feel hesitant to speak up, um, to ask other peers, other patients that are undergoing dialysis uh, to learn from them. So communication, ask questions, understand your treatments, and be very active and involved in every aspect of your dialysis. I think that's crucial 
uh, to to make the best of it and to do better. Absolutely, that makes sense. Um, and if someone is interested in in considering other dialysis treatments, um, you know, what types of questions or considerations um, should they be thinking about or asking their nephrologist about? That's a great question, and I think it's an important one because depending on each individual situation, you may have a former education about the types of dialysis before you actually need dialysis, but sometimes it, it can take you by surprise. Something may happen just acutely and, and you ended up on dialysis uh, b before you were able to understand your options. So that's why you need to ask your team about what your options are. There's a ton of educational uh, programs that your dialysis unit will provide for you. They will assess what your uh, feasibility and uh, benefits could be for you individually to perform different types of dialysis and continue to address that over time uh, based on how you're doing and what your needs are. I would say Great. also, uh, sorry, um, depending on your unit, there are units that may not have home dialysis as, as part of what they um, do in their units. So, so I always tell everyone, ask for second opinion. You know, it's, it's okay to look outside the block and to see what other options might be uh, in the proximity of your home. So don't just be limited if your unit does not have a home dialysis program to just stop the conversation there. The, the beauty about home therapies, for example, is that you can very well uh, do home dialysis and be uh, going to a unit that is a little far from you from your home, as I mentioned, you're going to be going there just once a month. Uh, so just, you know, think outside the box, ask for your options. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. And one other, uh, one last question that I have, um, you know, many people may be interested in the opportunity to receive a kidney transplant. And so how can individuals start a conversation with their nephrologist or other care team members to determine if um, they are a candidate and, and the steps that they might need to take to move forward? Fiona, exactly like that. Don't feel afraid. Just ask your team that you want to explore that possibility. Uh, I have to say most dialysis units and most providers, I'm going to be very proactive um, giving you that choice. Um, just ask for it. Is your right? Um, it's a process. You know, I, I tell all my patients, ask for a referral. Give yourself the opportunity to have an expert team to evaluate if, they are, if transplant is the right treatment for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bermudez. It's such a pleasure and uh, a privilege to have uh, your uh, your insights and access to your uh, to your time today. Um, so thank you again. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Antonio Kane to share a brief presentation about his role as a renal dietitian. Hi, Antonio. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, everyone, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, I'm Antonio Kane, a registered and licensed dietitian. Uh, I work here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, and so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. I won't take too long. Um, I do want to just give a special thanks to the moderator for today and to Dr. Bermudez um, for the introduction and, and kicking us off for today. So we'll go ahead and get started. Next slide. So what is a renal dietitian? So before we go into what a renal dietitian is, I want to put a little bit of context around some buzzwords that you may have heard um, around the clinic, around a nutritionist and a dietitian. So while a nutritionist and a dietitian both have very similar skills in education, um, there is one uh, key difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian. And that's primarily because a dietitian um, is registered, kind of like your registered nurses, and also licensed to practice in the state or states in which they practice. So plain and simple, a dietitian is a licensed professional. So then what makes a renal dietitian? So because renal disease or kidney disease is such a specialized area, a renal dietitian is one who is a licensed professional who specializes in nutritional needs for people with kidney disease. Uh, renal dietitians have more training um, in certain foods and how those foods might affect your bone health, your overall health, and your heart health. So the key thing to take away is that a dietitian or a renal dietitian's understanding of food and nutrition is totally necessary to help you treat and control the progression of kidney disease and where there is a tool and a resource to encourage and empower you 
and assist you in having the best quality of life. Next slide. So your renal dietitian will empower you. Um, a very empowering statement in itself. But when you think of that, what do you think of? What do you think about? How, how is a dietitian empowering? How will they help you? What does that look like? What do they do? How do they remain true to this statement? So in one way is that overall, the dietitian is there to help you to monitor your overall nutrition health. What would that look like possibly? That could possibly look like checking your weight, adjusting, adjusting your eating plan, providing you with meal plans and recipes and other tools to help you meet certain nutritional goals. So it's key to understand that keeping track of many nutrients, as I stated, I work in the area of dialysis. So when you look at dialysis and the dialysis diet, sometimes it can be very challenging. So the dietitian is there as a resource to help you track your nutrients um, in the foods that you may eat and how those things may affect certain health outcomes so that you're reaching recommended guidelines. Additionally, we may check blood work, blood test results, and make recommendations to help keep balance around those results. But overall, it is the key role of the, of the dietitian to be there to support you and encourage you around food and nutrition so that it's enjoyable while simultaneously helping you reach those dietary guidelines. Next slide. And then these are a few common misconceptions about renal dietitians, and I would say dietitians in general. You may have heard a couple of those, may not, but um, they're there. So I'll just go through a couple of those for you. So one being um, on the top of the list is our, our profession is, is diverse. Um, and so depending on what part of the country you're in, what city or what state you live in, this may very well be true for your area. But overall, when you look at the individuals who are licensed to practice or registered dietitians, about Roughly 92% of those individuals are female, leaving the remaining 10 to 11% being male. Additionally, if you break it down by race or ethnicity, you'll find that most, uh, the most ethnic group of registered dietitians are white Americans, leading the way at about 67%. Uh, Hispanic and Latino coming in next at about 11%. Asian Americans, about 9%. And Black and African Americans, about 8%. So again, depending on what part of the country you're in, what city you're in, it may appear to be diverse, but when you look at the number of registered dietitians, it's not a, uh, there's definitely some opportunity there. Um, one of the other things is we don't make meal plans. So I would say of all the things that I'm responsible for as a renal dietitian, um, making a meal plan. So if you were to add a few words in there, it probably would be a little bit more true. So if you were to say, we don't like to make meal plans, that would be more accurate, but it's, we don't make meal plans. So there are studies out there that show that making meal plan, that making dietary modifications, making small diet changes sometimes has a better effect. But if you think back to the original slide, working in dialysis or kidney disease is such a specialized area. Um, you will find that dietitians who work in this area will more than more than than not make meal plans for their patients, um, and it's a great tool. They can also guide you and lead you to places to find other recipes. They can also help you find quick tips, uh, food demonstrations. There's so many other things around meal planning that are out there um, that that your dietitian can help you find. Um, the other three, if you were to kind of lump those together, they kind of fit together. We don't eat like everyone else. We are the food police and we are judging your food. So first thing is we're not the food police. We're not running around with a light, tracking people down, knocking their food out of their hand or shoving their food you know, away from their face. We don't do any of that. Um, it's a no judgment zone. What we, we do know is that when we take on this profession, one of the very first things we do is accept that we will do no harm. So we're there not to, we're there not to harm you. We're there to help you. Um, and we do eat like everyone else. And as a matter of fact, it, I think if you put those three together, it's, it's pretty much the opposite. If we're looking at your food and I'm speaking from, exi uh, from experience, if I'm looking at your food, it's because I'm envious because I'm probably denying myself from something that I really want that's on your plate. So I'm not judging you at all. Um, and your dietitians aren't there for that, but they are there um, as a resource, as I said, as a, as a tool um, and someone to encourage and to guide you. And I hope you walk away understanding that today. Um, that will conclude my little portion of the presentation. I hope that I was able to give you a couple of things that you could walk away with. If I didn't, maybe it strikes you to um, think of some questions that make you a little bit more intrigued to dig, to learn more about what we do and who we are. And I'll be around throughout the end of the presentation to answer a few of those questions for you. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much, Antonio. That's really wonderful. And, and clearly a renal dietitian 
uh, has to have such precise knowledge of uh, the the nuances of a kidney patient because uh, I understand um, one's nutrition plan might vary depending on where they are in, in kidney disease stage or what other comorbid conditions they may be dealing with. Um, so you have your work cut out for you for sure. Um, and so let me ask you, when you are working with a patient, uh, do you ever um, uh, have an opportunity to address cultural differences that they may have in their approach to food? You know, great question. And actually, um, I have the opportunity, as I said before, I'm, I'm coming to you from Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, and I work, um, and, and in our state, we have a huge Native American population. Um, and I, I want to say we have the largest landmass area of remaining Pueblos in the country. And so very, very diverse in that way. So to answer the question, when working with our patients, we absolutely must always consider cultural differences um, when it comes to the approaches to food. Healthy eating looks different across all cultures, all communities, um, from where we come from and where we may currently live. So dietitian nutritionists, um, they must work to create an atmosphere um, that allows the patient to trust you. It allows the patient to communicate in, you know, their differences um, in, a, again, a judgment-free zone. And then lastly, the dietitian's advice and treatment plan um, needs to be appropriate and effectively matched to the patient's lifestyle, their overall living conditions, their dietary needs, and overall their food culture. Great, that's really that's really wonderful. Um, and so, how does a renal dietitian interact with uh, and and work with other members of the the kidney patients care team to help manage um, their treatment, their medications, um, you know, their treatment plan? Okay, so we, um, as as everyone will see, there's a large group of us who do make up the the healthcare team, and each of us bring valuable skill sets to the team when it comes to caring for our patients. A dietitian is uniquely um, positioned that we work with everyone, um, understanding that the patient is at the core, the patient is at the center, and we kind of partner with them and allow them to guide their care. Um, uniquely in the area where I work, we're considered mineral bone disease managers. And so we manage the medications that are centered around vitamin D and calcium and phosphorus. Um, we work with very closely with the nurses and the physicians with getting the right medications, making sure that it's soothing and comforting um, once the individuals take them and learning how they take them. We do dosing um, when it comes to certain medications. Uh, we also work uh, very closely with our social workers. So if we have patients who may have transportation issues and so they have this trend of missing treatments, we work with them, partner with our social workers to be kind of creative on how we can get our patients to come to treatment treatments more. Um, you also have some dietitians out there that are skilled um, not necessarily in my area of expertise, but you have some that are skillful with insurances. So they, again, partner with social workers to talk about individuals and getting generic brands versus name brand medications, um, making medications more uh, accessible and affordable for patients. Um, and then working directly in the clinic, we're there, we round with the physicians, we round with the social workers, we work very closely with the nurses, again, helping with medication adjustments and things like that. So it's a great partnership. We are very useful, uh, very valuable asset to the team. That's great. Yeah, and and sp speaking specifically for dialysis patients, um, I understand that you know dialysis treatments can sometimes lower energy levels. And so, how are you able to advise a patient how they can keep their energy levels up? And do you work with the nephrologist to determine the root cause of the patient's lack of energy, or is there a dietary um, uh, treatment um, that that can help with that? So absolutely, you, you're you're totally correct. Patients um, will and, and, and oftentimes uh, will experience low energy levels, um, and they definitely can speak to the dietitian on ways to boost their energy. A good starting point, uh, I would believe, is working with the nephrologist as well as other team members um, to do a deeper dive um, into possible causes for feeling fatigued, drained, or just overall having low energy. Um, in many cases, this could simply be increasing the number of duration of treatment some to something as uh to a little more advanced like reviewing the patient's blood work correcting anemia um and anything that may come up as a, as a result of this deeper dive that's lowering the patient's energy however what we want to keep in mind is that whatever the cause the dietitian will be right there every step of the way um as a resource uh to help you so that we can get you feeling energized again 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Antonio. Um, thank you both, uh, Dr. Bermuda, Bermudez and Antonio, for the great discussion so far. Uh, if you're just joining us today, thank you for being part of Kidney Action Week. Uh, you're tuned in to our session titled The Dialysis Care Team, Meet the Key Players in Your Healthcare. We'll have a Q&A at the end of the session, but you don't have to wait to ask your questions. Uh, if you're on the Kidney Action Week platform, please drop your comments in right now into the chat box and we'll get to them a little bit later. Now I'd like to turn to uh, Ruth Simon who, um, to share her brief presentation about her role as a dialysis social worker. Ruth? Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us. And thanks to the American Kidney Fund for sponsoring this um, Kidney Action Week. I'm going to hopefully give you some insight into what a dialysis social worker does. I often get asked that not only by patients, but my friends are always like, what in the world do they need a social worker at a dialysis clinic for? We're going to find out. So if we look at the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about just what a dialysis social worker does. Um, one of my first jobs is to help patients adjust to the dialysis lifestyle. If you can imagine, and I'm guessing a lot of folks that are online don't even have to imagine because they've been through this, but for those of us who have not experienced it, personally, just imagine being told that your kidneys have shut down, you've got to depend on a machine and dialysis treatments to stay alive for the entire rest of your life unless you get a transplant, which is a major surgery. And on top of that, you've got to limit your fluids to 32 ounces, and you've got to watch what you eat, and on and on, and take these medicines it is very overwhelming. And sometimes I see new patients just go, I, I can't deal with all this. So that is one of my first jobs is to try to say, hey, everybody feels that way at first. Just settle down. We're going to all help you through it because that's what your care team is here for. Oftentimes, that overwhelmed feeling turns into more difficult emotions, such as anxiety or depression. You've got these folks whose lives are changing dramatically, and again, they are just at a loss of how they're going to handle it. Many of them are faced with not being able to work the jobs they were working. Um, they are worried about being a burden on their family. But again, that's where the care team, the whole team steps in to try to make the transition to dialysis easier for our patients. So you've heard about how the nephrologist and the dietitian help in their roles. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I help. I always tell my patients, I'm the non-medical person. You know, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a dietitian. Um, I like to think of myself as the warm and fuzzy member of the team, um, the one that hopefully you feel very comfortable talking to. And if you don't know who to turn to, you say, hey, I can always ask the social worker because she'll know who to point me to, even if she doesn't know the answer to my questions. Of course, part of my job that's very important is identifying resources for patients because a lot of them have no idea what dialysis is all about or what it entails. They suddenly go often from working full time to looking at being on disability, having all sorts of insurance issues. I start with usually trying to help them identify their strengths. And interestingly, a lot of the patient's strengths are actually within the patient themselves. And I always say, Let's look at what's within you that you can count on, like your spiritual faith or your positive attitude or these loving family members that are in your home with you. Then we focus on, you know, what strengths can you build? And one of the important ones that we focus on, the whole team does, is becoming treatment adherent because you really need to do what the, the nephrologist tells you, what the dietitian tells you, take your medicine, watch your diet, come to treatments. And it is very important to try to get patients to see that as an opportunity rather than a life sentence. Um, I offer education on those treatment issues. I also offer education on things like rights and responsibilities 
what to do if you have a grievance, which I guess in the vernacular would be a complaint if you have something that's not setting well with you. Um, I am one of the frontline people in the complaint department and I always encourage patients, please start with me. Let's see if we can work on this issue and then we'll run it up, up the chain of command if we need to. It's also education on modality in center patients, trying to encourage them to consider home treatment and always trying to get folks to say, hey, is transplant something I want to consider? On the next slide, you'll see another very important part of my job is advocating for patients. Um, just helping them figure out where to go is one thing, but sometimes you actually have to step in and help them. You know, how do I get my disability and Medicare benefits? Or can I qualify for Medicaid? Um, in addition to the team members we're talking about here today, we also have a insurance coordinator who addresses some of those sticky issues with getting disability, Medicare, and all the insurance issues. You know, helping patients find other agencies like American Kidney Fund that are willing to help and assist them with financial difficulties. And then one of, one of the toughest ones in my area is how do I find a ride to dialysis? As I say, we kind of live in the middle of nowhere in Southern Virginia, and there's no public transportation. So oftentimes the biggest challenge is just figuring out how to get our people here for their treatments. Now, those are just some of the situations and questions that I can help with, but I wanna show you another very important part of my role, and this is the fun part, it's called patient engagement. So if you will flip to the next slide, you will see how my team does some of this stuff. Um, in this picture, you will see the angel is my dietitian. Her name's Judy, and I'm there in the devil costume. And in the middle is a social work intern that I had last summer. And we were educating our patients on fluids. You know, in summer, it's so hard for them to limit their fluid intake to that 32 ounces. So we did a role play where I was the devil saying, you know, oh, you can drink some more. It won't hurt you. And of course, our dietitian is like, no, 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 only four cups. And she actually gave them the little eight ounce green cup as a reminder of, you know, this is how much you should drink per day. And then we had our Daisy, the dialysis patient, our intern who was comparing, will I listen to the devil or will I listen to the angel? And of course the right answer was always listen to the angel and watch your fluids. Another really fun education we did, you'll see on the next slide, this was about <laughs> binders. And if you don't know, binders are what dialysis patients have to take every time they eat to keep their phosphorus in goal. Not every patient has to take them, but the great majority of them do. And a binder actually has to be in your tummy when the food is there with the high phosphorus to bind onto it and get rid of it. So there again is my dietitian, Judy. She is dressed up as a slice of pizza, which is very high in phosphorus and other things dialysis patients need to stay away from. And you can see me as the mighty binder. Um, we get kind of cheesy with this stuff sometimes, but we well, had a really good time all day when I would latch on to her and stomp out the phosphorus. So those are the kind of things we have a lot of fun with. I think our patients appreciate that. It makes them laugh. It, but more importantly, it makes them remember things because they're like, oh, yeah, I got to take my binder or the, the, the pizza with the danger sign on it will get the best of me. Um, I think that's the end of my presentation. So I like what I do, as you can see. <laughs> and I that's like wonderful, <laughs> Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to see uh, the energy and creativity with which you engage with your patients and uh, just really wonderful. Um, question, you you talk about how you work with uh, patients, um, the, the emotional toll that dialysis can take on an individual. Do you ever find yourself also providing emotional support to family members? Well, absolutely. I have um, caregivers call that may be feeling overwhelmed 
or just that maybe they're concerned about their um, family member or loved one that's on dialysis, that they're showing signs of depression. I always try to meet with the caregiver or family member when the patients start, either in person or with a phone call, try to make sure they have one of my cards as well as the patient so that they can call me if they need something, because I'm more than happy to talk with them. And sometimes we actually will have family meetings that are very helpful. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that information, Ruth, and appreciate your time today. Um, we're going to move on now and um, talk to a care partner, Gabrielle. Um, and instead of a presentation, we wanted to have a, a question and answer session with you. Um, so can you tell us, uh, the audience, a little bit, um, Gabrielle, about your experience as a care partner and what led you to find yourself in this role? <laughs> um, so it kind of happened right after COVID. Um, my husband at the time didn't kind of know what's going on with his body. And uh, one night he passed out in the middle of the night, no idea what was going on. There was a lot of fluid on his, his legs and uh, we had to call the ambulance. The ambulance got here. And then days later, they were informing us that his kidneys were shutting down. Um, that was the first hospital experience that we had. And then uh, after that, hospital after hospital, diagnosis after diagnosis going untreated and then finally the big major one where we finally got an answer that his kidneys were completely have almost have completely shut down and from there on it's kind of been me by his side every doctor's appointment as much as I can me working full time and then us having a five-year-old child running around the house it's been kind of hard but that's what you have to do as a care partner that must be incredibly hard. Um, Gabrielle, thank you for sharing that story with us. Um, you know, how do you, how are you able to maintain a positive outlook um, with, you know, this situation that you and your husband are in is must be uh, um, emotionally taxing for you as well as the, as the care partner. Do you have any advice or tips for other family members so that they can stay positive uh, throughout this journey? Yeah, uh, I think the best thing that you can do is just talk to each other. The more communication that you have with the part with your partner or even with other family members to at least let you know what you're going through. Having the support, um, like we have our child that runs around and drives us crazy half the time, but then we also have our relatives, like my mother and then his father, as well as my mother-in-law all support us. And with them, those are our biggest support teams and Q being a smiling person as much as he is, he never lets anything distract him. Yeah, oh, that's really helpful to, to hear. Um, and I know that for a home dialysis patient, certainly care partners are, um, you know, an active uh, role oftentimes. But for in-center dialysis patients, um, how do you support your husband? With him being an in-center, we get up probably about the same time every morning he has to go through dialysis. I at least try to help him get his breakfast ready in the morning. Uh, I work from home. My job as being as lean as they are, they do allow me to work from home to where I'm sitting at home watching our daughter. I work. He is inside the dialysis center working. I consider it working because he's there most of the day. Um, and then we have a phone call in the afternoon because yes, a lot of dialysis patients do not drive. Um, my husband is willing enough and sure enough that he drives his own way. Um, he gets on the phone, calls me in the afternoon, and then we have a long conversation, a long 45 minute conversation, probably about absolutely nothing. Uh, just the company of having somebody on the phone. And then he comes home, he hangs out with our daughter until I go into the office and then I get to come home. And then we kind of just hang out the rest of the evening. Wow, that's that's really wonderful. Um, a lot of a lot of commitment and love there. Um, is there anything that you can tell our audience? Uh, you know, maybe tips on uh, things you wish you knew earlier about uh, being a care partner or in center dialysis. The things that I wish I knew earlier. Um, I think I wish I wish 
I knew the signs more um, because when you get to know the signs a little bit more, you get to catch it earlier. So it's not as completely far gone. Um, like other patients might not have known, but I think the signs of early sign detection, um, because he is African-American, they do have a higher chance of kidney failure. Um, so getting to know the signs a little bit more and early on in stage, I wish I got to know a little bit more. Yeah, that's such an important point. So I appreciate your mentioning that. Um, are there any resources, because I know that you and your husband are AKF ambassadors, um, are there any resources that um, that the American Kidney Fund has that have been helpful to you or your husband's diagnosis? Uh, yeah, well, there's a lot of, there's a whole group of people that you can talk to. My father-in-law is an ambassador. Um, when Quentin got diagnosed with it, my father-in-law, lovely Patrick Jean, he gave us so much information. I feel like at one point there was a brought ton of information that he handed us. And then he led us to, you, to the American Kidney League. And then from there on, it was just kind of open doors to where they're not, they're not, they don't want to shut you away. They want you to help you. They want to be like a, it's kind of like a guardian angel in a tank. Yeah, no, that's really a great description of it. And um, I really, uh, so appreciative, Gabrielle, of your um, taking the time today to share this very personal story and your perspective as a care partner. I know it's been very useful to so many in our audience today who may find themselves in a similar position to you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. So um, now um, I hope that you found all of these presentations interesting. I know I have. Um, and I'd like to now turn to our Q&A segment, um, where we invite our audience to ask questions to any of our presenters. I'm sure there are many questions. We've already been receiving several. Um, as a reminder, you can type your questions uh, and comments into the chat box if you're watching on our Kidney Action Week platform, and we will try to get to as many as possible today. Um, so a first one here, um, uh, Gabrielle, what is the difference between a caregiver and a care partner? Um, a caregiver would be like your nurse. Those are caregivers. A care partner, I feel like it's somebody who stands beside you as your significant other who goes through everything that we go through and you're stuck beside the patient. Okay, yeah. Um, this is for Antonio. Um, Antonio, can you give a few tips for eating if you are living with stage four kidney disease? Um, well, the first thing that, that I would recommend is, is most definitely uh, speaking with a dietitian. Um, there are several nutrients that you may need to um, balance or things you may need to limit or avoid. So without having the, uh, if you remember back to the presentation, one of the things that we look at is blood work. So without having that blood work there, um, I wouldn't be able to just give you a blanket statement because you want to make sure that whatever the treatment plan is or whatever the tips are, that it's individualized specifically for you. So without having that in front of me, I can't give it to you. So um, just general over, overall, you know, it's general healthy eating. So making sure that you're getting a balanced meal, food and diets, being modest with your protein intake, lowering your sodium levels, watching out for your fluid intake. So it's just those general eating guidelines and tips, but to learn more, to get more in depth about what's specific and individualized for you, I would say seek out a dietitian, have them sit down, review that blood, those blood results with you, and they can give you a more individualized approach to what's necessary for you. Thank you. Uh, here's one for Ruth. How do you help patients identify therapists or other mental health professionals uh, that might be useful for them? Well, we have a list of the providers that are local to our community. Again, in a rural area such as ours, there's not a lot of choices. There's the public mental health, and then our local hospital has a behavioral health branch. So I always have the numbers for those two resources and there are a few independent counselors. So I have a list that I can give them and we have a two, or, I think just two psychiatrists in the area if they're interested in, you know, approaching it from a medication standpoint. So um, just having those names and numbers ready for them when they need it. 
That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and this is one for Dr. Bedmuthis and also maybe Ruth. Uh, what are some of the reasons a person may not be eligible to receive a transplant? How can patients work with their care team to avoid this? So there's going to be a lot of different reasons. Um, and I'd like to start to answer that question with a very important point, which is that at, at a point of time, you may not qualify for the transplant, but that doesn't mean that that may not change over time if you're able to overcome whichever barrier that is. A common situation uh, is overweight, especially the, the risk for undergoing transplantation when there is a lot of um, fat tissue in the abdomen is that the um, connection of the new kidney into your blood vessels may be troublesome. And that could potentially uh, create complications and minimize your benefits after transplantation. So uh, obesity is a common uh, one that again, don't feel defeated. You know, work with your dietitian, with your nephrologist, uh, find a dietary uh, plan, exercise. You know, you can definitely achieve the goal your transplant team may uh, give you in order to become a candidate later on. There's, again, going to be a variety of reasons. If someone has active cancer, uh, that's not a, a good idea to receive a transplant. The medications that you will require to keep your transplant alive, your new organ, uh, or the anti-rejection medications could potentially make cancers worse. So that is a big no-no. If you have had cancer, depending on the type of cancer and how long you were treated for it, your transplant team may give you a um, reason amount, reasoning, reasonable amount of time for you to be able to potentially qualify for the kidney. Um, I guess last but not least would be uh, your heart condition. If your heart appears to be severely damaged, um, going to a big surgery like a kidney transplant could be life-threatening. Uh, so that might be a reason for you not to be a good candidate. Thank you. And Ruth, same question. Have you uh, encountered scenarios where, uh, you know, uh, patients may be ineligible that you've tried to help navigate uh, with them through? Definitely. One of the biggest social barriers is inadequate insurance. So if patients don't have the insurance they would need for transplant, I try to help them find better coverage. Um, sometimes that's very hard. Sometimes it's just, hey, we just need to switch you over to a different type of, of carrier for, for the insurance you have. Um, another big social barrier is lack of a support network. And that's going back to what was previously said about being a care partner. If a person does not have a care partner that they're living alone and have no one that's willing to come and be their care partner, the transplant centers, no, you've got to have a social support network before we'll approve you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and speaking of having a social support network, um, Gabrielle, how do you avoid burnout as a care partner? I think the way I avoid burnout, um, I try to have as much of the girls weekend as I possibly can. He, Quinn actually encourages it a lot more when he first got diagnosed with it. Um, I kind of just wanted to be home all the time. I didn't want to go out. I didn't, I went to work, I came home. That was my routine. Um, but nowadays he, even when he first got diagnosed, he pushed it on me to go out, have a life, enjoy your friends, have your friends there to, if you need somebody to lean on. So um, we try, I try to at least go out at least once a month with my girlfriends just to take a breather and do a kind of like a reset. Yeah, that's I'm sure um, a really important part of part of this. Um, Antonio, when should a renal dietitian be assigned to a patient? Um, this individual says, my nephrologist recommends waiting until I'm on dialysis. Um, you know, I always say go with the guidance of the physician because although we work together um, as a cohesive team, um, the, the primary 
caretaker for your care is the physician. Um, for, but from a personal standpoint, um, it is my belief that any individual who has um, any signs of kidney disease should not wait until they're on dialysis. Because if you think back to my original slide, we talk about how the dietitian is very integral and skilled and specialized in not only the treatment and control, but also the progression of the disease in its process. So the sooner you can consult with an RD, the sooner you can start a clear and precise treatment plan and possibly slow the progression of the disease. So I wouldn't recommend waiting until the patient is on dialysis. Thank you. Uh, here's another one for Dr. Bermudez. Uh, how can your care team help you if you're on a home dialysis treatment? How can they assist you if you run into any complications? That's a great question. So once you are doing dialysis at home, you are going to be having support 24-7. So your team should allow you to, to call them at any time you require uh, any assistance. You're gonna have a specific phone number to call for any technical uh, concerns. And you're gonna have also your home uh, nurse uh, phone number to call them during the day or during the night. And I, I speak for myself, my patients uh, will have free access to me and my team at any time day or night. So I think that is important to know. The fact that you're at home doesn't mean you're on your own. You're going to have full support and full assistance at all times. Thank you. And just to follow up to that, uh, doctor, uh, someone asked specifically about um, how do you work with your care team to determine um, what which form of home dialysis might be right for you? I think that the that question makes me very happy because I have learned over the past two to three years uh, that as assessing uh, my patients every time I meet them is important. I, I think I mentioned that earlier. You may not be a good uh, candidate or, or home therapy may not be a good idea at some point in your life, but time, life changes. And situation changes. And that's why I, I encourage the team and me as a nephrologist to continue to assess the needs every time I see my patients. We have great tools that will help your team um, go um, over your home situation, your medical situation, your activities, hobby, work, uh, individual characteristics to, to help determine which type of dialysis is best for you. So your team should be assessing this regularly and should be notifying you and sharing with you which options you have and particularly which ones may be better for you, not just for quality of life, but for your individual uh, characteristics. Thank you. Um, and here's another one drilling down a little bit. What resources are available to help individuals access treatments and things like the kidney transplant list? Um, Ruth, I'll ask you that question first. Well, if you're wanting to get on the transplant list, the first step is you've got to get referred. So in my clinics, I the social worker is the main point of referral. Nephrologists can also refer, but usually I'm the one that does it here. Um, and just saying, hey, I'm interested, and my first question is going to be, okay, these are the four centers closest to us. Where would you like to be referred? Do you want to be dually referred? Because I am located right on the Virginia-North Carolina border, so some people want to be referred to one place in Virginia and one place in North Carolina. Um, just ask. That's, you know, as we said, communication is is everything and, and being not unafraid to ask any question. No such thing as a stupid question for your care team. Thank you. That's so important. Dr. Bermudez, any other resources that you can um, point to for the audience? I agree with Ruth. Um, all of them are great. Um, depending on the transplant department, patients can self-refer. Um, so, but, but again, I think your team, your social worker, your nephrologist, they, they will help navigate, they will help you navigate that process. I wanted to echo uh, what Ruth said about dual listing, the more the merrier. Uh, do talk to your team, you know, if it's possible for you to be uh, on the list on uh, more than one um, transplant center that is highly recommended. 
Great, thank you. And Gabrielle, were there any resources for you that were you found really helpful when you and your husband started this uh, journey? Um, I think the resources that we had were when uh, my father-in-law introduced us, introduced us to AKF. Um, that was a big resource for us. Um, and when Quentin got diagnosed with it, uh, he as well, just so many documents on kind of what to expect along the way as your journey continues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, panel. Um, well, our Q&A session has come to an end. Um, I just want to ask each of you for a final thought. Um, if you could just provide the audience one final takeaway, you know, uh, most important point that you'd like each of them, uh, uh, you'd like them to, to come away with after today's presentation. Dr. Bedmuthis, I'll start with you. Thank you, Fiona. Um, just remember, you're the main player of your team. You are that glue. You are keeping us all together. So ask questions. Um, ask for your family to be involved understand your, the process, understand, understand your blood work, your treatments, what the other options uh, you might have, um, communication, very, very important. Thank you. Antonio? Um, I'd just like to say, just remember that um, it, it's a highly specialized area. Dietitians are your food and nutrition experts um, who specialize in helping you meet all of your nutritional needs. Um, we're here to answer all of your food-related questions and even much more. Um, and then just take this away. I heard this many years ago when I was in, in school uh, to become a dietitian. And it said that if the doctors of today don't become the dietitians or nutritionists of tomorrow, the nutritionists or dietitians of tomorrow will become the doctors of today. Well, that's definitely some food for thought. <laughs> um, really great. Uh, Ruth, same question for you. A key takeaway. What I would like for everyone to remember is that a positive attitude and forward looking stance is just as important as keeping your phosphorus down or watching your fluids. And I'm just going to leave with a thought that one of my wiser, older patients said, he said, I don't like this hand I've been dealt, but it's just like poker. I'm going to play it because I'm still in the game. <laughs> I love it. Gabrielle, how about you? A final thought. Um, I think the final thought to me was be to have open communication. Have the open communication with your partner as well as with their doctors so that you know what the other person is going through. You want them to feel like they're not alone, that there's always support, no matter if it's your nephrologist, your know, dietitian, or even your social worker. You don't have a partner at home. You still have partners in your family but always the communication. You always want to have open communication with everybody. Thank you. Well, I'm hearing a lot of the same communication, qu ask questions, positive outlook, uh, a lot of universals there. Um, so I want to thank each of you again, Dr. Bermudez, um, Antonio Kane, Ruth Simon, and Gabrielle Turner G. Um, we very much appreciate your time and your expertise, and I'm certain your insights have helped so many here today. So thank you so much. Um, to our Kidney Action Week viewers, thank you so much for watching today. That concludes the end of this session. Stay tuned for a mission moment on transplant, followed by our next session, Maintaining Health Through the Transplant Journey. Uh, also, please do take a moment to complete the survey. You'll see a link at the bottom of your video screen here. It only takes a few minutes to complete, and it will really help us to understand your feedback and uh, help us plan for future sessions. So thank you again, and enjoy the rest of Kidney Action Week. <laughs>